This is ContraZoom, where we go back and forth about film. I'm your host, Dakota Arsenault. The 13th annual Toronto Japanese Film Festival ran from June 6th to the 20th, and for the fourth time, we are covering the best of the fest. The festival celebrates the best Japanese releases that often don't get distribution deals outside of Japan. Joining me today is Jeff Ballmer, one half of the Classic Movies Live podcast, who was last heard on our last episode, number 280, Canadian Screen Awards 2024. Welcome back to the show, Jeff. How are you? I'm pretty good. Was that? I'm pretty good. Uh, was that actually the last episode? Yes, I've. Uh, I, I will address that uh, momentarily. But yes, I, I have not put out an episode since then. Oh well, uh, hello again, everybody. Uh, <laughs> it's been a while. Yes, it it has been. It has uh, about uh, a month or so. Uh, but yes, I, I do want to address that the show has been off the air for the last few weeks. I started a new job and got very busy, and I sort of had to prioritize my personal life over the podcast. Um, going forward for the next little while, the show will hopefully be bi-weekly instead of weekly. And once things settle down, I will sort of reevaluate things to see what schedule works best for me. So uh, apologies to anyone confused why there has been no new episodes for the last few weeks. And I hope you enjoyed today's show. And uh, maybe you're like Jeff and didn't even notice that there's been no new episodes the last few weeks either. Well, I do appreciate the transparency. So <laughs> thank you. Um, well. That aside, we are here to talk about the Toronto Japanese Film Festival. This was actually your first time attending the festival. I'd love to know what your experiences are because I've only been able to cover the festival remotely. Back when I was in Toronto, I, it was during COVID, and so they only had remote screenings. And then since I've moved out to to Vancouver, I haven't been able to attend in person. I know Rachel did, I believe, last year, but I'd love to know uh, your experiences with the festival. Uh, this festival is really cool. It's uh, held at the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center, which is, I believe, in York. It's still technically sort of within Toronto, but it's uh, more the greater Toronto area than like downtown where I am. Um, so it took a bit to get there, but the area that it's in is really nice. Um, it's, you know, more of an industry park, but like lots of uh, lots of walking, lots of good atmosphere and uh, the Japanese Canadian Cultural Center itself is really nice. Uh, they held these. They held the screenings in what looked like um, it looked like sort of a gymnasium. I don't know what it looks like when it's not primed for film screenings. So uh, yeah, I guess I can't speak to that exactly. But it looked like a gymnasium, and it was pretty comfortable. Uh, but the the equipment setup was it felt very do it yourself compared to something more like TIFF, like professional enough that, you know, it was it wasn't unprofessional. But um, you could tell in a few cases that, like, I think one or two of the screen, uh, one or two of the movies that I was um, one or two of the movies that I saw there in person seemed like they were uh, from DVDs that they had been sent. <laughs> Not in a bad way. Like they'd clearly been sent those because they were part of the festival. But, you know, you go to TIFF and it's always 100. Everything's always on the projector specifically. Interesting. Uh, how many screenings were you able to attend in person? In person, I only saw three. Okay. Because it was, it did take me an hour to get there. So I only decided I, I work, um, I made sure that all of my screenings were across two trips because an hour there and back is a big commitment. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'll bet. Uh, what was the like the, the crowd like uh, when you were seeing these films? Was it like mostly Japanese people in the audiences, and, and sort of what was the, the the reactions to these films? Um. Well, I saw I saw two movies that I would call closer to crowd pleasers, like where you would expect a lot of an audience reaction, and one where I really wouldn't have. And uh, my expectations were basically met. Uh, I saw a movie that I'll talk about later called Mondays, which was a comedy that got a uh, lot of laughter from the audience. Um, I saw a young adult movie called Don't Call It Mystery that got like some in audience interaction, but it was a little muted. Um, and then I saw a movie called Revolver Lily, which uh, looks like an action movie. It is actually a historical period piece, and it was pretty muted. Uh, people seemed to enjoy it, but like it wasn't a very loud crowd. As for the makeup of the crowd, I was in the front, so I wasn't like actively looking at most of the crowd, but it seemed like I think it was more it, it seemed like it was much more of a Western audience. There was like a mix because 
of the uh, environment it was in. But I did see a lot of uh, people around my age that didn't look like they had any familial Japanese roots. But then I did occasionally see plenty of Japanese people coming. Um, I wouldn't be able to speak to like much more exact than that, but it seemed like a decent mix, I guess. Nice. Well, that sounds really interesting. I know uh, I know Rachel had a good time when she would go and attend the screenings in person uh, last year, and something I'm, I'm very jealous of that I, I haven't been able to experience yet myself. Well, I hope that you do get the opportunity, because I had a great time, and uh, I, I hope that the Japanese Co- Canadian Cultural Center was happy to have me, and I know they'd be happy to have you. <laughs> Thank you very much. Uh, I do really like covering this festival. As I said, this is the fourth time covering another podcast. They've been, you know, very gracious and nice and, you know, giving us whatever screeners we're requ- we've requested over the years. Uh, and, and the people that work at the festival are, are always very easy to deal with. So I love supporting this festival. You know, it's easy to cover TIFF. Everyone wants to hear about TIFF and, and cover that and be there and all that fun stuff. But it's these like, you know, more localized regional film festivals that I think are a lot of fun. You can really experience what it's like to be a movie lover. And, and it's one that like, you know, I'm always telling people, I'm like, Hey, Hey, you know, there's the big festivals in your city, but maybe have you tried the more niche ones, the more regional specific ones, things like that genre specific ones, because you get to see some really interesting things. Um, Mm -hmm. So I'm, I'm glad that you were able to experience it for the first time. Um, yeah, I mean, we'll talk about some of the things we saw, but these are movies that, uh, I'm really happy that I saw there, even the ones that I didn't like as much. I'm really happy I saw them because I enjoyed them, uh, for one thing. And I'm happy I saw them there because there's, you know, one of the movies that I'm going to talk about today apparently came out in Japanese theaters in 2022, exists on Blu-ray in Japan, and I had never heard about it before this week. And beyond me never having heard about it, it doesn't have a release over here. This was a premiere, despite it apparently already existing in Blu-ray form. Yeah. Uh, And that's something, you know, we briefly were talking about before we start recording as well. And, you know, I said, for me, Japan is one of, you know, the powerhouse cinema markets in the world. You know, in my opinion, I think probably have put out some of the greatest movies ever made. Um, And... We hear about, you know, they they dominate the Oscars in the best international category. They usually have a nominee. They're always in contention to win, things like that. But you sort of forget that they have this entire industry that we really have no, you know, connection to. We only see what gets distribution in in North America, you know, plays at the big festivals, you know, Cannes, TIFF, you know, whatever, Mm -hmm. Venice. And so we often don't hear about every other movie. Like how often have I, you know, I'll hear about a movie as like, Oh, this was the highest grossing film in France last year. I'm like, I've never heard of this movie. Don't know the director. Don't know any of the stars. How is this the highest grossing movie? And we're not hearing about this over here. And so it's really interesting getting a chance like this to be like, all right, what's the broader spectrum of modern Japanese cinema? It's not just, you know, Raisuke Hamaguchi and, and people of his ilk releasing movies. There's a wide range of stuff. And, and I think, you sort of experience it a bit better where you're watching movies, you you watch some dramas, uh, you watch some comedies, you watch sort of an action historical movie. I don't know how, how else to really describe that. But you sort of saw a good snapshot of, you know, what's current in Japan right now, or mm-hmm. at least in the last year or so. Yeah, and uh, I mean, it should go without saying very diverse slate of films but as you were saying like the reason it doesn't go without saying the stuff we get over here is you know a very a very small amount of that we don't get nearly as much and not to say that Ryusuke Hamaguchi and um uh Kora Eda are anything alike but like if if those were the only two uh if those were the only two directors from Japan then um, there wouldn't be much diversity in Japanese films. There'd only be two directors. So, mm-hmm. yeah, yeah, very true. Uh, so today we are going to talk about five movies that we saw, two that we both saw, one that only I saw, and two that only you saw. So we're going to start things off with the movies that we both saw. And the first one is one called Stay Mum, and this was actually the international premiere. So this has only ever played in Japan. Uh, and so I'm going to read the, the IMDb plot summary. Some of them are good. Some of them aren't so good, but we'll, we'll sort of fill in the gaps because obviously I doubt anyone 
has heard of of any of these films unless you are in Japan listening to this right now and you probably are familiar with these. If you are, thank you very much for checking this out. If not, these are maybe some movies you might want to try to find uh, on the horizon afterward. But um, uh, the, the plot description for Stay Mum is uh, Chisako is a writer and her father Kozo had a long-standing feud and have been living apart for a long time. However, now that Kozo, who lives alone, has dementia... She returns to her hometown to begin taking care of him. One day, she rescues a boy who has lost his memory in an accident and has signs of abuse on his body. To protect him, she pretends about being his mother and starts living with the boy. Is this lie a love? Sorry, is this lie a sin or love? So, when I was sort of reading up about this movie, I was a little unsure how it would go. I thought it was going to be a very overly dramatic film, uh, a little too over the top for me. Uh, and I started watching it, and I sort of appreciate it. For the most part, it's a fairly light film given its subject matter. You know, it's you know about a, a woman uh, returning to take care of her father who has dementia, and you know she shows up on his doorstep, and he's like, "I don't know who you are." And he basically spent the whole movie being like, "I have no idea who this woman is that's living in my house now and taking care of me." Uh, no matter how many times she says, "I'm your daughter," um, and then. She reconnects with an old friend and they go out drinking and the friend ends up uh, deciding to drive home and they I don't I couldn't tell if they actually hit the boy with her car or they just almost hit him with the car. But either way, they come across a boy in the middle of the road at night and he's got bruises all over his body and a rope tied around his ankle. And so she brings him home and realizes that he also has uh, no memory. So this is a woman who is dealing with having to be the memory for two different people at a time when she'd rather not have any memory at all. And from there, she kind of takes this boy in because she realizes, oh, he was abused at home. I can be a better parent to him and all this sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, I thought this was going to be way more dark and depressing and sad than it was, but I ended up uh, really enjoying this one. What about you, uh, Jeff? Yeah, I uh, I agree. I really liked this one. Um, I'll probably mention it a few more times throughout the uh, throughout the episode. But when I would go to the in person screenings, um, one of the announcers, the person who was announcing each of the movies, he would always talk about the three movies that were currently at the at at every single time that I went, they were currently tied for the uh, biggest award that the Toronto Japanese Film Festival has to offer. And one of those films was Stay Mum. So uh, I'd been sort of talking to you behind the scenes, keeping you updated with what those three movies were and sort of what the progress was on those. Uh, And Stay Mum was not the first one I watched. The first one I watched was uh, way more depressing. (laughs) And it was also about dementia. And so after watching a very depressing dementia movie, which was still very good, I read the I read the uh, synopsis of this and was like, I don't I want to watch something that is not really depressing and about dementia right now. So I put this one off way longer than I should have. Uh, But when I actually watched it, I was surprised to find that of those three that are in contention, and I'll reveal what those are over the course of the episode, because we're talking about those anyway, of those three that was in uh, of those three that were in contention. Uh, I think this one is probably the most well-rounded in terms of tone, uh, by which I mostly mean that as it it handles its relatively darker, bleaker subject matter very well, while also not itself feeling really bleak. Mm -hmm. It's, uh, It's very, this movie is really funny. It's not a comedy, but it's got a lot of really funny moments. Uh, the characters are very likable, um, it's uh and it does handle all of its um very heavy themes. This movie talks a lot about kidnapping, the role of uh the role of parents in Japanese culture right now, um sort of from multiple different angles, talks about dementia, um, you know, talks a lot about dementia actually. I guess it is one of the characters has dementia, but it talks way more about it than even another movie we're gonna talk about that talks about dementia. Um it talks about its very heavy themes uh, with you know, pr- pretty skillfully and still manages to stay pretty consistently, definitely consistently entertaining is almost the right word uh, without being, without ever being like too depressing, I guess. 
Yeah, I think that's a good way of saying it. Um, you know, you mentioned uh, Hirokazu Koreeda earlier, and for the most part, it, the movie sort of feels a bit like Shoplifters. If anyone was familiar with that movie from a few years ago, where it's sort of this, you know, found family, uh, someone taking in a child that's not their own, and so you're watching it, and and very right away, you you start to the question that came to my mind was, okay, are they going to treat this scenario as realistic as the real world can be? Or are they going to take liberties with it and we are going to get, I don't want to call it a Hollywoodized version of a story, but but something along those lines. Because, you know, the story is, this is a woman who's taking in a child that is not her own, who comes from an abusive family. And so right away, you start to to think in your head of like, okay, well, the end game here is she either gets found out or she doesn't get found out. That's that's it. I'm not going to fully reveal uh, how this movie ends because I think it's one that's very worthwhile watching. But that's that's the first thing in my mind that popped into my head when I when I start watching this movie. Is that a question that sort of came to you as well? Yeah, and um, it was one that really stuck with me because what this movie does really well um, is for most of the movie – it doesn't really give you quite enough to conclusive. I think I thought to conclusively say whether or not you should be on her side, mm-hmm. or at least for me, because um, this movie sort of, she takes in the child because she thinks that this child is from an abusive home and the movie gives you enough clues so that you may also think that, but it doesn't give you enough clues so that you can know that within the context of the movie which I think is really nice because it constantly, it it, like every time I was happy for her, I was also like, is she the villain here? (laughs) Possibly. Yeah, I I think that's fair. Uh, And so, yeah, it's sort of, most of the movie is very shopless lifters like, and then it almost takes a bit of a, david fincher turn david fincher-esque turn and once again i don't want to spoil too much but it's this these ideas as soon as you 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 hear about what the plot of this movie is about you know things are eventually going to have to come to a head in some sort and when these things do come ahead that's when there's a bit of a of a unique twist to the movie (laughs) Mm -hmm. and i think that's uh probably the best way to say it without saying anything specific did the twist work for you or were you not on board with it? Um, I don't entirely know how to answer that question. <laughs> I want to say, I, I want to say it did work for me and it worked for me because it didn't come in the last minute of the movie. There was mm. a lot of afterwards as well. And, uh, the, the epilogue to this movie really made everything work. I don't know if actually the epilogue is structured in such a way that I'm not a hundred percent sure if the twist that you're talking about is also the twist that I'm talking about. (laughs) Basically from when the boy's father shows up onwards. Well, I was trying to not say anything, but yes. Yeah. I think that, uh, I think that with the epilogue, it really did work for me. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, I did, it did for me as well. It gets, uh, a little, um, I don't want to say cheesy, but it sort of, uh, it changes the tone of the movie significantly at one point where it almost feels a bit like a soap opera. There's a, there's a one moment in particular, a line reading from the young boy in particular that I'm, I'm talking about. Uh, but overall, I sort of appreciated that, you know, we got this sort of, a light dramedy about a woman taking care of her father and trying to take care of this son. And then eventually it sort of becomes something very different. Uh, mm-hmm. But I was on board with the movie basically the whole way through. Yeah. I, uh, I think, I think I mostly agree. I think that um, really my, my trepidation about what you were con- about the twist is more like, I guess if it had ended there, I would have been like, huh, that's a weird place to end it, but it didn't. <laughs> yes. Yes, that's true. Uh, All right, let us move on to our second film, and that is one called Missing. And the plot of this is a girl vanishes while walking, leaving her family devastated. As months pass without clues, rumors about her mother's actions intensify online, straining her marriage. This is a movie that takes place, I believe it's six months after a kidnapping has occurred. So we don't see the kidnapping. We don't see anything beforehand. It literally, you know, plops us into this story months after this kidnapping has occurred. So we already, you know, are starting at a very high emotional level. And it sort of maintains that level 
throughout the entire film. This is this is a movie that doesn't really have breaks for levity, for humor, for uh any sense of normalcy. This is the whole movie of a couple trying to find their child. And and once again, kind of like Stay Mum, I, I don't want to completely spoil the ending for this, but this is a, this is a very intense movie where you have two performers, a ostensibly the mother and the father, dealing with their grief in two very different ways. You have the mother who is very outwards in her grief, a lot of emotion, tears, breakdowns, um, things like that versus the husband who has internalized a lot of this pain and doesn't know how to, you know, put the pieces of his life back together, let alone how to put the pieces of his wife's back life back together. And how are they compatible as a couple still after experiencing such a traumatic thing and what they need to do to move forward? So it's very interesting watching the two different acting styles because, you know, they're they're so di- diametrically opposed. You have a very loud, over-the-top emotional performance, and you have a very grounded inwards performance, and seeing how they sort of both work together and clash together was fascinating. This is one a movie that you are very much a big fan of. Uh, you wrote about it on, for ContraZoomPod.com, and you gave it, uh, I believe, four stars out of five or four and a half stars out of five. But uh, But please tell me what about this movie you love so much. Well, uh, so I was just talking about the, so this was the second of those three movies that I'm talking about that I saw. And, uh, you know, right after watching another dementia movie, I was like, I don't want to watch another movie that's this bleak. So I went to missing big mistake, bleakest movie of the fest by far. (laughs) Um, for what it's worth, I actually really like bleak movies. So, uh, this one really did work for me. Um, I thought this movie was devastating. Um, I think it's very, uh, I guess just even in terms of structure, it's much more slice of life than plotted. And I think that like, there's, there's hints through, not hints really throughout the movie. It kind of like hints at the, well, okay. Now I'm saying the word again, but it sort of hints at like a plot that could develop and it just never gives you that. It's just, there is no plot to this. This is six months after a girl has gone missing I won't spoil any of the movie, but realistically, if we're picking up six months afterwards, there's kind of two, there's kind of two options. Either they have a, they have such a promising lead that uh, it's going to work out and they're going to finally get their girl back or nothing is going to happen and nothing is ever going to happen again because it's been six months. Uh, And this movie is very uneventful in terms of narrative, um, which is just really draining to watch in a good way. I like that actually, but it, it may, it's very, it's very bleak and very hopeless. Um, but throughout, I think I really like how this sort of examines what that grief looks like because this movie is very much, um, I mean, this movie is very much a movie about people dealing with loss and grieving and, Um, you know, just without necessarily the person that they're grieving being dead. There is a potential, uh, there is a potential version of not a version of the events of stay mum that results in this movie as the parent, uh, as being the perspective of the parents that whose boy just went missing out of nowhere. Um, and I think what I really what I really liked about this movie is that you you did highlight that it was mostly the mother and the father, and I would definitely put them as the leads of this movie. But I think this movie, I think missing um, what really works for me is that it expands beyond that. A big theme of this movie is how the media plays into this. The only reason that this uh, that like the girl is still in the public conscience six months later is because there's a local newsman who's been running this story for six months, trying to figure out what's going on. But in order to run this story and in order to make it so that people actually tune in, they have to fake a lot of, well, not fake a lot of details, but they really have to pump up the truth, make it like there's a lot of artifice to keeping the story alive. Um, beyond that, there's also her, uh, the the mother's um the mother's brother is a big part of this movie 
and he's just someone who wants to be left alone, but he can't move past this because he was briefly a suspect in the uh, disappearance of his niece. So he's going to have to live with this until this news story goes away. And um, then of course, like the mother interacting with, uh, with the online forums constantly shows sort of what the public thinks about this news story that's gone on way too long. Everyone's kind of over it, but they can't get past it because there was no closure here. So these people who lost their daughter are making it everyone else's, everyone else's problem, which sort of, um, I just think that the way that it sort of builds in all those perspectives is really interesting and uh, really sad. It makes all of the, it makes the actual people who are close to this missing girl um, that much more, I mean, that much more tragic of characters because they're the only people that care this long. And it's not really the world's fault. Like the world can't care about anyone for that long because that's just not how the world works. There's way too many people in it. Yeah. I think the, having the, the contrast of the journalist side of things helped break up the movie. So that way it wasn't just, put it sort of bluntly trauma porn the whole time of, you know, these grieving parents. And so by having this, you know, story of a journalist who wants to cover the story, wants to be truthful about the story, but also understands the reality of media and how it works and getting people's attention and their help and all that sort of stuff. I thought that broke the movie up nicely. So that way you weren't kind of on, you know, the the tip top of a roller coaster for the entire time you at least had a bit of a flow going and mm -hmm. it also added a bit more narrative to it as well because you're wondering how they're going to tackle you know the media side of things next and it seemed like every time they tried to do something helpful they weren't actually helping or not helping in the right way or or all these sort of things and you want in one of the things i was wondering is like how much patience is this journalist going to have for this family? Like, obviously, you look at it, and if you're in that position, you'd, you'd hope that everyone would help you as long as it takes to find your missing child. But on the flip side, you know, you're watching this from the journalist's perspective and be like, okay, well, how long until he gets told he has to do a different story? He can't keep returning to the same well. Or, you know, every time he tries to work with this family, he ends up butting heads with them and getting told that he's doing it wrong or making things worse. Like, what's what's his threshold here as well? And so because of that, I think it broke the movie up nicely, and I really appreciate it, and it made the movie more digestible for me. And I think with the journalist, too, um, there's a line. I don't remember the exact line, but there's a line about halfway through the movie where someone, I think it might be the uncle, says to the journalist, you didn't know her. Like, you didn't know this girl. You're doing this out of the kindness of your heart. You're not doing it for her because you never met her. Mm -hmm. And I think that that's kind of it puts him in a really interesting position, too, because, like, he's this person who is trying to do the right thing uh, and everyone is telling him not to. Because uh, it's, I mean, it's been six months. Like, it's just, he's got to move on. His bosses are telling him to move on because he's not getting ratings. The people, uh, the, the people that are actually close to this missing girl can't really ask him to do any more because he's, he's reached the end of his usefulness for them. Like, it's, uh, it's, it's interesting. I think that the narrative of this really is like, how do each of these people move on? And it gets there almost like, dragging every single one of them kicking and screaming no one wants to move on but eventually they have to mm -hmm. yeah and we do get a nice sort of other story about another family that has their child go missing and there's some parallels and so you you wonder is this all connected and so it kind of turns into a bit of a mystery at that point um mm -hmm. so it does change up the genre ever so slightly in sort of adding this you know different element to it but but overall it is about this you know one couple trying to find their child yeah and i think that um one thing i really like about this movie because i like unconventional narratives and movies that don't have a narrative when it works out and i think that what i like about this movie every time it does imply a narrative it sort of uh it, it sort of kills it but in an interesting way like i won't talk about I won't talk too much more about the family you mentioned, but like 
it sort it briefly becomes a mystery and then it sort of resolves that mystery in a way that is unexpected i'll say yeah i think uh i think that's a fair way of putting it uh all right shall we move on to the next movie or do you have any last things you want to say about uh missing i uh think that i mean all of the movies that i saw here uh at, at toronto japanese film festival i would recommend if someone is if someone has access to them uh this one is one of my favorites of the year so far and i really really hope more people get the opportunity to see it nice i'm i'm very happy to hear that uh okay well then let's move on to the next one this is one that just you're going to talk about and it's a movie called great absence and it actually had played at tiff and so this is a an encore presentation of it uh presented by the festival and it actually won the grand jury prize for best film so this is the third film of the three that you've been sort of uh dancing about here so uh this is only one that you saw i wasn't able to watch it so uh please take it away what uh what this was this movie about and what did you think of it okay uh i do not have the imdb description in front of me i should have prepared that i i have that i can do that if you wish oh Um, that would be excellent follows the story of the reconciliation of a father and son who had been estranged for a long time among lost memories and dispersed pieces of lives Okay, that's very vague, but that gives me a good starting point. (laughs) This movie is, um, I think I mentioned it several times before, just I sort of danced around it. This is a movie about a son reconciling with his father who has dementia. And um, one of the saddest things, I won't say too much because I think it's probably too personal to put out there, but I have in my life people who are in a similar situation, reconciling with parents who have dementia and the hardest part of that, I think, at least from an outsider perspective, um, I don't, I can't even imagine what it's like from an insider perspective. From an outsider perspective, the hardest part is that it's too late. Uh, that the it's about a son trying to reckon. It's, it's about a tr- son trying to rekindle this relationship, but his father isn't in a position where he can have any kind of relationship anymore because he has dementia. He doesn't fully know where he is. He thinks there's a government plot to there's he thinks there's a government plot to kill him or something. He he actually thinks he's been kidnapped and is in a different country. I don't remember if he actually says what country he thinks he's in and that his son is coming to him like wink, wink to try and help him get out. Uh, So there's just there's nothing there anymore. There's nothing that can there. That is a relationship that cannot be rekindled. But his son also hasn't talked to him in 20 years. So at the same time, it's sort of about his son learning what happened in the last 20 years of his father's life, It during which he was remarried to a woman that it sounded like he cheated on his son's mother with. Uh, and as his mental state deteriorated, so too did that relationship in some pretty unfortunate ways. Uh, so it's about sort of, it's, more than just his son trying to rekindle the relationship with his father. It's more trying him trying to figure out what happened in these 20 years that he was gone and trying to sort of figure out where he is in relation to any of the relationships that could have been affected during that 20 years. I would say that the emotional climax of this movie actually isn't the son reconciling with his father. Cause that's just not possible anymore. It's the son reconciling with his mother-in-law, which happened, which comes completely out of left field. I guess that's om- that could almost be considered a twist. So I do apologize for the spoiler, but that like, um, but this movie is much more sort of him kind of dealing with what has happened while he was away. Okay, that's that's very interesting. Uh, so it's sort of a little bit similar. You know, you you did say that there were two movies talking about dementia. Um, do you have a preference in in the way it's handled in in one film over the other? I think that in Great Absence, and like Great Absence versus Stay Mum, handle these handle them in almost completely incompatible ways, in my opinion. I think what Stay Stay Mum does is it well it puts us in the shoes of i guess both of them put us in the shoes of the child having to deal with that dementia but in stay mum it's really more she's she's taking care of her father who can't whose mind is slowly deteriorating 
while she's sort of trying to build up the mind of this person who uh, has amnesia. And so there's that contrast there. And that's sort of where that main conflict comes from. Great absence, the way that I think that it's the movie's approach to dementia is a lot more is actually maybe a little more impersonal to the person who actually has it. And I don't say that, I don't mean that in a bad way. I think it's just more like the movie's title is Great Absence. And that's kind of what the movie is about. Because when your mind starts to deteriorate like that, you start to lose your presence. You start to become absent from the world. And that's sort of what this movie is about, is his son dealing with, one, his own absence, but then sort of, finding out about essentially the great absence that his that his father is leaving in the wake of his mind sort of deteriorating um i guess do i have a preference it's a lot harder to do the second one in a light-hearted way i would say um <laughs> so this is a much harder watch mm-hmm. but uh i wouldn't say i have a specific preference i think they're both very good in different ways this one is it might just be the filmmaking. I think this one's a little more focused. I think that of the two, this is the better movie. It's the harder to watch one, though. Okay, that's fair. That's fair. Uh, it looks like this movie actually got its world premiere at TIFF last year. Uh, I assume it didn't cross your your radar path when you were attending the festival, did it? It. I'm sure I saw it on a schedule, but uh, when I saw at... Um, when I saw it on the list of movies at Toronto Japanese Film Festival, it was the first time I remembered seeing it. Mm-hmm. So it did not, uh, it didn't, it didn't ping my radar at TIFF. Now it sounds like you definitely preferred Missing, and and I think you, by the sounds of it, enjoyed Stay Mum more as well. Can you talk a bit about why you think maybe this won the Grand Jury Prize for Best Film, and sort of your thoughts on it winning that award? Um, so I did enjoy Stay Mum more, but I, like I said, I think Great Absence is of those two, the better. It's a little more focused. Okay. Um, and I think that, I think that, um, Great Absence might possibly be a little more, this is not quite the right word, but it might possibly be a little more universal than Missing. Mm. Missing is not hard to understand by any stretch and i think it's very good in what it does but missing also almost it's almost hostile to having a narrative where great absence does kind of build up that narrative and it builds up that narrative around something that i don't think is that uncommon of an experience now it might just be because i am close to people who are in similar situations but I think that having an older parent who you are having, who you may not have talked to in maybe not 20 years, but in who you may not have talked to as much as you'd like to and sort of getting coming to terms with the fact that they're near the end of their life is a very easy to relate to experience. Mm -hmm. Uh, The specific parameters of that obviously change depending on the movie, but I think that, uh, it's a little more, you know, I I think it's a little more universal experience, but it also, uh, has a little more of a narrative and it is very well executed within that as well. I do think it is a phenomenal movie. Mm -hmm. Um, so, you know, I don't want any of this to say, to seem like I'm saying the only reason it won is because this is a narrative film and the other one is not. I think it's an, I think it's a very good movie. Like I think it deserves to win. Yeah. Okay. That's fair enough. Um, do you have any, any last things you want to say about Gra- great absence or are you, are you good to move on? Uh, this has such a strange opening. Uh, it's really funny actually. Like when they, when the context of the opening becomes a little more clear, it's very funny. The opening is like, uh, the man who is suffering from dementia. We don't know this at this, at this point, but he's like frantically going through his house, putting everything he possibly can into a briefcase and he like gets outside dressed up with it, holding his briefcase and then the police come and like he has this big stoic look on his face. And later on, we discover that like he just thinks he's been kidnapped by another country, which is not even remotely true, has no basis in reality. It, 
like not even a lip, not even the seed of truth in reality and just comes completely out of nowhere. So he just thinks he's very important. And I think that uh, with the context, the opening of this movie becomes very funny. But the movie itself is not that funny. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Fair enough. Uh, all right. So the next movie we're going to talk about is one that I just saw, and that is called Life is Climbing. And it was the Toronto premiere of the film, and it won the Kobayashi Audience Choice Award. So Great Absence was the, the jury prize. I think there's seven people on the jury that, that selected the, the top prize. And then Life is Climbing was the Audience Choice Award. Um, this is a documentary. I, I knew nothing about it other than the fact that it won this award. So I was like, all right, well, I'll watch it and, and, you know, make my own opinions without even reading about it. I didn't even know it was a documentary. Um, and this movie starts out with a quote from Helen Keller. And that's kind of all we get in terms of any sort of an idea of what this is about. And very quickly, we realize that it is uh, about a man named Koba who is blind and his passion is rock climbing. And he has a friend and um, he's his climbing partner, a guy named uh, Naoya, who is his uh, visual guide for climbing. And so he is also a, a climbing expert and he owns several climbing gyms and he assists Koba with his uh, his rock climbing adventures in, in terms of like giving him direction and things like that. And we learn quickly that Koba is actually a world champion uh, rock climber in terms of um, paraclimbing is what it's called. So it's people with with different abilities. And so he competes against other blind contestants for uh, in rock climbing competition. And he co consistently wins gold medals. And we see a, a montage of all this. What's very interesting is. This movie features no narration whatsoever. So the only information we ever learn is from what we see on screen and what people say while they are on screen. So we don't, we get no backstory. We, we get no idea of, of context of the setting. It is strictly what is happening in the very moment. That is what we know. And I really appreciate that. I, I sort of feel like I've become jaded by documentaries recently where they used to be one of my favorite genres. And for some reason, whether it's movies with so much narration or reenactments or things like that, I just feel a lot of documentaries feel very false to me lately. And so it takes a lot for me to be impressed by a documentary. And this is one that really impressed me. I, I just watched it today before we were recording this. And it's just a very simple story about two men who are like rock climbing. And, and one of them who is overcoming any sort of, uh, hindrance his disability might have caused him to live life to the fullest um we learn that koba you know went blind in his uh mid-20s he got a de degenerative eye disease and uh, slowly he went completely blind to the point where he is now where he is 100 percent blindness um and he was already an active person and enjoyed climbing and things like that so he was able to keep it up and then the movie sort of transitions to uh Nyoya bringing him to the United States so that way he can climb Nyoya's favorite spots, which were in Utah and Colorado. And it seems like from what I can gather, Koba basically just does indoor rock climbing. He isn't as it doesn't seem to be as familiar or proficient with outdoor rock climbing. Um like actual mountain sort of thing. Mm -hmm. And so we're, we're getting to watch him and, and sort of watching this, there's definitely shades of a movie like free solo, a, a fantastic documentary from a few years ago where we sort of, you know, if anyone saw that, saw the ins and outs of what it's like to be a rock climber from, you know, one of the world's greatest rock climbers, Alex Hanold, um, Hanold, Hanod. I can't remember his name. Um, but just seeing that and comparing it to this and, and seeing the overlap of them, it is very great to see, especially since there's similar uh, vestiges that we are looking at in, you know, the American climbing scene. Uh, this movie is, is very simply made. Like, I don't mean to diminish this too much, but it sort of feels like it was made by like a film student. There is very little technique involved uh a lot of the edits are just fade outs and then a new scene starts with the music just sort of ending and then a new scene starting uh there's nothing really fancy we don't get any real back and forth there's no um title cards in terms of like uh oh and this is who this person is and their backstory we get a little bit of that during the competition scenes where it says first place first place first place and stuff like that and 
uh, we'll, we'll say like, oh, Utah or Colorado, but that's about it in terms of, you know, techniques that we get. And it just sort of goes to show that you don't need great technique to make a great documentary. You just need a really interesting subject and uh, access to be able to tap into these emotions that whatever they're feeling and going through. And so for that, I really enjoyed this movie, despite the fact that it doesn't have, you know, the sheer beauty of something like Free Solo does. But it's a unique enough story that I learned a lot about this specific person and their uh, circumstances. Uh, this is one I have been hoping to watch. I have not seen this. I hope I will still get the opportunity. Um, it sounds great. I I think that um, I really like looking at some of the previous Kobayashi Award Audience Choice Award winners, including this one. I really like this award. Uh, I have not seen most of the... I haven't seen any of the movies that have won the Kobayashi Audience Choice Award, unfortunately. But looking through sort of summaries and what kind of movies they are, uh, I think that it's I think this is a really good audience choice award because it has so much diversity uh, to my knowledge. This is very possibly the first documentary to win. Uh, it's definitely the first documentary to win since at least 2018 or 2017. Um but uh, there's there's a lot of variety in here. You get, you know, there was a documentary this year. Last year it was an animated movie. Uh, three, four years ago, a crime movie won. And before that, uh, before that, it was just a comedy road trip movie. I think there's a lot of really nice. Um, I think it's really cool that this this does not seem like an easy to predict award. I definitely did not. Uh, well, I didn't see Life is Climbing ahead of time, but of the movies that were on my radar, uh, I would never... Well, actually, this one wasn't on my radar. It just didn't strike me that this could be an award, uh, an Audience Choice Award winner. So I really like that um, it, it, it could just go to anything. I like that this is a very... Oh, this is a very open award. Mm-hmm. Uh, I have seen two of the previous winners for the audience choice. I saw Midnight Swan and Under the Open Sky. And Under the Open Sky was actually the the first time I uh, became aware of uh, Koji Yakusha, who most people now know from the lead of Perfect Days. Mm -hmm. And so I've actually seen, I think, two or three Yakusha films because of the Toronto Japanese Film Festival. So when Perfect Days came out, I was already fully aware of who Koji Yakusha was and his stature within the Japanese film community. Um, and so this is definitely an award to sort of keep an eye out. I think the reason why this won the Audience Choice Award is because it is a fairly breezy film. You know, there's some quite a bit of lightness and, and comedy to it. Um, it's about someone overcoming obstacles in a way that, you know, you can cheer them on. And it's a very, very impressive obstacle that they're overcoming as well. You know, the idea of, you know, rock climbing, uh, you know, uh, something, uh, a giant wall in, in a national park in the United States is terrifying for me. I have perfect vision. I cannot imagine what that's like when you are, you know, you know, a couple hundred feet up in the air, you have no vision whatsoever, and you are relying on someone accurately yelling at you left, right, up, down of where to place your hands and your feet and hoping that you are, you know, clipping yourself in properly and your foot's in the right place and you're grabbing the right rock and all that sort of stuff. So Watching this movie, I can absolutely see how it would be an audience favorite and, and a very deserving winner, in my opinion. Mm -hmm. I I hope I get the chance to see this one. It's um it's clearly jumped right to the top of my radar. So it's just <laughs> finding time and hoping that uh, either the screener that I have still works or that I can find an opportunity to see it outside of that. Yeah. Uh, you know, I already mentioned Free Solo, but if if you're a fan of that movie, it's not obviously the same thing. But if you enjoyed the subject matter of Free Solo, you'll absolutely enjoy the subject matter of, of Life is Climbing as well. Uh, okay, let us go to the last film that we're talking about. And this will be uh, one that just you talk about. And that is Monday's See You This Week. This in quotation marks. Um, and this was the Toronto premiere of this film. And the IMDb description says, Akemi Yoshikawa discovers that her whole office is stuck in a time loop, repeating the same stressful work week over and over. Together with her colleagues, she has to find out how to break the loop. 
So tell me about Monday's See You this week. So the first thing that I noticed about this movie, uh, and this is the first, this is how I actually open every conversation, because I actually told, tell all my friends about this movie. It's very funny. Uh, and every time I open that conversation with, uh, the title is too long. Should be Mondays. <laughs> the title should be Mondays. It should not be Mondays, see you this week. I think it's too much. Um, but anyway, uh, this movie was very funny. And this is one I'm very glad that I had the opportunity to see with the crowd because the crowd was also very into it. So they were, you know, laughing at all the jokes and there were a lot of them. It's a very dense comedy movie. Um, it is a time loop movie. And I feel like over the course of, I guess, the last 10 years now, time loop has become, has gone from like, my my impression back when I was much younger was that a time loop was that there were like four or five time loop movies. Like it was a weird novelty that came out every now and then. Now it's basically just a whole genre, which, you know, for better and worse. Um, this one is interesting because I think that uh, I, I, I very rarely see a time loop that goes for exactly seven days. And that's what this was. It goes for a full week. Um, but I think the funniest part of this, it's a time loop, but it's specifically commentary on Japanese work culture. They are, it, it's a time loop for seven days. And during that seven days, Akemi Yoshikawa is in the office 24 seven. She sleeps in the office. She does all her work there. She's, she doesn't move from the office. So like, she doesn't notice she's in a time loop at first, but also part of the reason she doesn't notice is because that's just what her work life is like. It's awful. It's hell. Um, but I think the funniest part of this very early on, when she finally discovers that the whole office is stuck in a time loop, the way that she discovers this, there's two other people, two of her coworkers, uh, keep telling her from the first minutes, we're in a time loop and she doesn't believe them, but they keep telling her this. And eventually they figure out a way to convince her that in fact, she is in a time loop and she should believe them now. And then she finds out and she's the third person in the office to notice. She says, oh, my God, why didn't you guys tell everyone else? They're like, we did. The way that offices work, no one will listen to us because we're the junior employees. So what we have to do is we have to tell everyone in the office, but we have to tell them in order of seniority because no, because your superior, Akebi, will not listen to us. He will only listen to you. So you have to figure out a way to convince him. Because we can't. And uh, that, and like, that's the main theme of so much of this movie is like that they have to, uh, that they have to work their way up this chain of seniority. One of the funniest moments in this is after the entire office knows they're in a time loop. Everyone has, uh, er everyone has been informed. Everyone knows they're in a time loop. They're working on their way to get out of it. And for whatever reason, like they, they find out, they, they end up in the time loop again, despite thinking they should be out of it. And then the secretary comes up and says, this is the 70th time loop. When is it going to end? And people are like, wait a minute, you knew this too? And she's like, yeah. Why didn't you tell anybody? I did. I've been telling you guys for 70 weeks and no one will listen to me because I'm the secretary. <laughs> so. Um, yeah, I think that, uh, it's, it's a very funny workplace comedy and I think it might be even funnier if, uh, I don't know how many Japanese viewers we have, uh, listeners we have, if you, if we do have any, uh, then the, uh, then this is going to be even better for them because I think this is a very, uh, a very funny commentary on Japanese, uh, work culture. And I think it work. It, it very obviously works outside of that. I don't have that context and it was still very funny, but I think with that context, this is uh, e even better. And also actually speaking of under the open sky, uh, this stars Makita sports as the boss of uh, the office who was also in under the open sky. I haven't seen that though. So I don't know what he, who he was in that. Oh, interesting. Yeah. He doesn't have a, a photo on his IMDb page. So I can, I do not remember. And it's been several years since I've seen that. So I, I, I have no comment context there. Uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, this sounds really interesting. Yeah. I feel like Japan lately has been, uh, has been doing some, some great, um, 
uh, what's it called? Uh, time loop movies. Uh, we were talking about before we start recording a movie called River, uh, and then uh, the, also from the same director, Beyond the Infinite Two Minutes, one that you hadn't seen, but one that I highly, highly recommend. Uh, oh, I have but, seen it now. Oh, oh, you have seen it now? Excellent. Yeah, both both movies are absolutely fantastic it takes on the the, the time loop uh formula and i just sort of appreciate that japan's been sort of able to find this like uh very niche genre and sort of make some some absolute bangers and it sounds like this is an excellent addition to uh to the category Mm -hmm. i think that um the i i guess like the only thing that did bug me a little bit about this movie it starts in a very it starts with a very like the the opening title sequence is very surreal and very strange and the movie does not keep up that tone now for what it's worth i don't think it should have i just think that the tonal shift is very jarring i think the tone of the movie is very good i think it's very strange that the opening title sequence is uh like something out of a tim and eric horror skit (laughs) that's fair that's fair uh okay but this is still one overall you were you were pretty happy that you got to see especially the fact that you got to see it with the crowd yes i am very happy of the uh, of the three that i saw in person this was the one i liked the most by a lot uh of the three that i saw in person i liked going to each of them and i generally liked all of them this is the one where i was like this is actually the one where i was making a trip out specifically to see it and so i was like on the fence whether or not i should even make that trip I'm very glad I did. It was very worth the trip. Nice. I'm I'm very happy to hear that. Yeah, I, I didn't get a, a screener for this one, uh, so I have not seen it yet. But hopefully uh, I can eventually see it because I, I do enjoy time loop movies. Yeah, this is actually one. We were talking about this before. This one has an official release date of 2022, and it released yeah. in, Jap- in Japan in 2022. A Blu-ray exists in Japan. This doesn't seem to have any kind of planned release over here beyond screening at the Toronto Japanese Film Festival, which is very much a shame. I hope that it does appear in some form that it is able to be seen by people over here, because like I said, while I'm sure the context of a Japanese workplace really, really helps this movie, uh, you don't need it. I really enjoyed this and I do not have that context. So I think that um, I, I I recommended this to all my friends. I'm recommending it to you now. I hope that that recommendation doesn't just die on the vine because it's not because no one can see it. Yeah, no, that's fair. Um, OK, do you have any last things you, you wish to say about Monday? See you this week or uh, or is that wrap it up for this film? Uh, that's probably all I all I have to say for this movie. Okay, that's that's fair. Uh, so those are those are five movies that we watched during this festival. I know you watched a couple others. Uh, I'm going to link to the reviews that you wrote in the show notes. You wrote about both Missing and a, another one that was called Don't Call It Mystery. I don't know if you want to very briefly give a, a bit of a synopsis about what Don't Call It Mystery is for people to, to check out the review to read more about it. Uh, don't Call It Mystery. It was a, it's sort of a young adult uh, Agatha Christie style mystery by which it's, I mean, it's basically just a mystery, but um, it uh, it's based on a manga. And uh, apparently there is a series um, based on this manga as well. And I don't know exactly how long all the arcs are, how long each mystery in the manga is. This was one particularly notable arc. Um, I believe that the cast is actually the same from the uh, from a previous TV drama adaptation, which um, I mean, I say it in my review. This feels like a continuation of a TV drama. uh, But if anyone is familiar with that story, I think that this is it's I mean, if anyone's familiar with the story, then I'm sure you already know about the movie. Uh, it is a movie that is, it was interesting. I we used to read, I used to read, read Detective Conan a lot, which uh, is another manga uh, that has like, it's another mystery manga that has like five or six chapter mysteries, uh, mystery arcs. And, um, but it's also very much, you know, from the nineties and early two thousands, I think it's still going on. But this was interesting because it's sort of a view into, uh, I guess, what the modern 
young adult mystery landscape is like in Japan. And that might be very, very niche. Uh, it's certainly not something that I have direct insight into for the most part, but it was something that I was uh, very happy to get a little bit of insight into. And I have some thoughts on it in general, which you will be able to read in the article linked below. Of course, yes. Thank you so much for for previewing that so excellently. Uh, Jeff, thank you so much again for, for coming on the show. I always love and appreciate when you when you make the time to do so. Uh, where can people uh, find you in more of your work? And uh, what, uh, what do you have going on for, for Classic Movies Live? Well, uh, as you just said, people can find more of me on Classic Movies Live. And at the moment, uh, we're only on Spotify. I think I've been saying at the moment for several years now. Uh, I do hope to eventually change that to be a little more available. But unfortunately, right now, that's just kind of the way it is. But we're on Spotify under Classic Movies Live. Our most recent episode just went up on the day of recording this. Uh, it is Inside Out 2. Pierre and I have some pretty... Uh, pretty strong thoughts on Pixar, just the state of Pixar right now and inside out to, you know, we did talk about the movie, but really it was more of an excuse to just talk about the studio, which uh, I think is interesting enough. I hope people will enjoy that. Um, We just recently really got started on a series called director's showdown, which is very tough to do episodes for because they take a lot of prep. uh, So they're not coming out very often. But uh, we're, we did, a few weeks ago, we did our second episode, which was, uh, which you were on, Dakota, which was, we need to talk about Kevin and Polytechnique. Uh, the, basically, a, it was a director showdown of Denis Villeneuve versus Lynn Ramsey. And I think next week or the week after will be our third episode where we are talking about a movie from Steve McQueen and a movie from Alejandro Iñárritu González. If I'm, I hope I'm remembering the name right. Right. That sounds right. Right. Uh, Alejandro González Iñárritu. González Iñárritu. I knew there was something (laughs) off about that. Yeah. Uh, well, I'm very curious to uh, to see what the pairing is and and how you make those two directors uh, comparable because uh, I, I think that's going to be a whole trend of this series is trying to guess what movies and how they they work together nicely in conversation with each other. So I'm very excited to listen to that. Well, I will. Uh, I won't spoil anything too much, but I'll say at a surface level, the pairing was very easy. We'll see how it fits, how it works out on a deeper level. At a surface level. It was almost one of the most natural pairings there was. Nice. Well, that that's very exciting to hear. Uh, all right. Well, this has been a That Shelf podcast. Visit ThatShelf.com for more great film discourse. Follow the show on Instagram, Twitter, and threads at ContraZoomPod. What are your favorite recent Japanese films? Send an email to ContraZoomPod at gmail.com. Thank you to Eric and Kevin Smale for the theme music and to Stephanie Pryor for the logo design. If you like to listen to podcasts on YouTube, we do post all episodes there as well. And if you really like the, like the show, consider tipping us on coffee. Thanks for checking us out. Mm-hmm.